Hello, everyone, and welcome to Metcalf Institute's 24th annual public lecture series. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf's executive director, and I'm joining you today from the traditional homelands of the Narragansett people who have stewarded this land and adjacent coastal waters for thousands of years. And today, as we explore a conversation that will touch on national security issues, it's, in, it's especially important to recognize that there are many indigenous nations within the US whose ongoing interests in the sustained security and well being of their lands and people must be part of this discussion too. University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been fostering informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We achieve this through a variety of approaches. We do science training for professional journalists, communication training for scientists, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers and practitioners from across the country to make science communication more inclusive and equitable. The next Inclusive SciComm Symposium will be held virtually this October, and we encourage you to visit the link in the chat to learn more. This year's lecture series explores the study, implementation, and reporting of equitable solutions and responses to the climate crisis. Climate change is already having starkly disproportionate impacts on low wealth communities and communities of color around the world. These inequities have inspired a range of innovative solutions that involve partnerships between researchers, communities, government agencies, nonprofits, and the private sector. Today, I am especially pleased to celebrate the annual Leeson Lecture as part of this year's series. This lecture was launched last year to honor Rob Leeson Jr., one of Metcalf Institute's longest serving advisory board members and a consistent advocate for our work. To honor that service and advocacy, um, we were very honored to receive donations from a group of more than 140 people who endowed the annual Robert Leeson Jr. Lecture. Rob's goals for Metcalf Institute as a board member and even now as an emeritus board member have always been to increase national awareness of our work and to build our donor base. By endowing an annual lecture in Rob's name, which is held each June as part of this series, those donors have ensured that we'll be able to honor Rob, advance his goals for Metcalf Institute and bring inspiring speakers together to achieve the informed public conversations we seek. So thank you, Rob for your dedication to Metcalf Institute's mission, and thanks to all of you who donated to make the annual Leeson Lecture possible. So now I'm thrilled to tell you about this year's Leeson Lecture. We all know the disastrous effects that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on our lives, mentally, physically, and economically. As we look toward life beyond the pandemic, whenever that may come, we must apply these lessons for another deadly global threat, climate change. The urgency of addressing the climate crisis requires specific actions to redress many of the same inequities that led to disproportionate impacts of COVID and the broader pandemic on Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, and other communities of color. We must think about our national mitigation and adaptation responses in new and creative ways using toolkits from a broad range of disciplines and experiences across risk and emergency management, national security, behavioral economics, science communication, policy, and other spaces. Today's Leeson Lecture speaker will help us to explore these tools and perhaps even offer some amount of a roadmap for navigating the years to come. No pressure. Um, so with that, we're really pleased to welcome Alice Hill, the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations. Ms. Hill is an attorney who's been a prominent proponent for change on Capitol Hill serving as a special assistant to President Obama, senior counselor to the secretary of the US Department of Homeland Security and senior director for resilience policy at the National Security Council. Throughout her career, she has worked on issues of national security from developing strategies and policies for biological and chemical threats to leading the creation of the Department of Homeland Security's first climate adaptation plan. As a special assistant to President Obama, she worked on climate resilience policy via the development of national risk management standards for floods, wildfires, and earthquakes, and growth of national capabilities for long-term drought resilience. Her current work at the Council of Foreign Relations centers around climate change risks, consequences, and responses through engagement with policy leaders, research, and furthering the climate conversation with public audiences. This is a frequent opinion contributor to outlets such as Axios, CNN, Foreign Affairs, and the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, among others. 
She serves as a board member for the Environmental Defense Fund, the Council on Strategic Risks, and the Center for Climate and Security, again, among many others. And she is a council member for the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education and the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. In 2020, Yale University and the op-ed project awarded Ms. Hill the Public Voices Fellowship on the climate crisis. And finally, I'll note that she has a new book coming out in August, published by Oxford University Press called The Fight for Climate After COVID-19. Today, she'll share some of her insights from that work that she's been doing and help us think about what's to come. With that, I welcome Alice Hill. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here today to give the Leeson Lecture for the Metcalf Institute. The Metcalf Institute, as you've noticed, Sunshine has an important mission to advance informed conversations about science and the environment. And never has that mission been of greater significance or relevance than today. The Institute's focus on professional development of journalists, scientists, and environmental communicators seems particularly prescient. So it's a real honor to give the Leeson Jr. lecture, Robert Leeson Jr. lecture, uh, named in honor of Robert Leeson Jr., who I understand has shown and demonstrated what a single individual can do through tireless advocacy to improve the response to the environmental challenges that we face. Uh, so I'm truly delighted to have a chance to meet today. One doesn't have to look far to detect that in an interconnected world, the emergence of a single catastrophic risk can bring communities, cities, and even nations to their knees. Consider Texas's plunge into darkness and freezing cold earlier this year. The Texas cold streak in February 2021 brought over a week of bitter conditions with temperatures dropping to minus two degrees Fahrenheit in some areas. With cold air and freezing wind gripping the state, the electric grid failed. Without power, nearly 4.5 million residents plunged into prolonged darkness. Across the state, people went without heat and sub-freezing temperatures for several days. Over 14 million residents, excuse me, over uh, 1 million residents were left without safe water to drink when the cold temperatures caused pipes to freeze and then burst. And for those residents with water, the chronic power outages meant that thousands lacked the electricity needed to boil the water and to render it safe for drinking. Nearly 200 people died in the freezing conditions, some in their beds. Officials lamented how most of these deaths were preventable and attributable to the fact that Texas simply could not guarantee that electricity would stay on during a severe winter cold event. Estimates of losses from the storm ran as high as $130 billion, making it the costliest weather event in Texas history. The cold spell also bore the telltale signs of climate change. The polar vortex, that ring of winds circling around the North Pole, had weakened, causing cold air to shoot out from the Arctic. Scientists have found evidence that as climate change causes temperatures to rise in the Arctic, it has the ability to alter the polar vortex, which increases the likelihood that frigid Arctic air will escape and then shock other parts of the planet. The extreme cold that Texas experienced was not unprecedented, as some news outlets would lead us to believe. Texas is really not a stranger to bouts of extreme cold. Over 120 years ago, Texas experienced record cold temperatures as uh, the thermometer plunged to 23 degrees below zero in February 1899. Some 30 years later in 1933, cold temperatures tied that all time record. In 1989, blistering cold hit, hit again forcing the energy grid operator for the state of Texas uh, to resort to rolling blackouts. 
in the wake of that 89 disaster, the Public Utility Commission of Texas recommended that all utilities, quote, incorporate the lessons learned during December of 1989 into the design of new facilities and correct defective freeze protection equipment prior to the onset of cold weather, end quote. That's a sound recommendation. Unfortunately, Texans failed to take heed. They had another freeze in 2011. That year, again, uh, the major utility in the state ordered rolling blackouts. Over 3 million customers, however, were left without power. After the 2011 freeze, regulators again issued a report advising the state to require the electric grid operators to invest in additional winterizing of energy infrastructure. Unfortunately, the state of Texas chose not to heed that warning either. The harm that Texas experienced this past February likely stemmed in large part from decisions not to invest money in preparing its electric grid for cold temperatures. That choice, of course, in hindsight, appears stunningly short-sighted. The loss of power, wastewater treatment, transportation and healthcare services imposed untold misery on the residents of Texas, all in the midst of the pandemic. If Texas had taken a different course, choosing to invest in risk reduction before disaster strikes, it would have saved not only money, but also lives. We know that every dollar spent on risk reduction can save six or more dollars in disaster recovery. This means that all of us and our community leaders should take steps today to reduce the harm that tomorrow will bring. Today, I will talk about what we can learn from another catastrophic risk, pandemics, to inform preparation for the emerging catastrophic risk of climate change. Science is at the center of understanding both of these threats. Pandemics, of course, have beleaguered people and communities since time immemorial. In the 14th century, the Black Death killed a third of the world's population. In 1918, 50 million people lost their lives in the Spanish flu pandemic. As a result of hundreds of years of experience with pandemics, humans know a lot about what needs to get done to prepare, even if we don't always put it to good use. Climate change impacts, on the other hand, bigger storms, greater temperature extremes, larger wildfires, more extreme precipitation, or what emergency managers call rain bombs, melting permafrost and sea level rise are unfamiliar threats. Humans have little or no experience with the ferocity of the events spawned by climate change. And that unfamiliarity leaves us deeply unprepared. No humans in recorded history have experienced the level and rate of change in our climate that now occurs. And that poses enormous challenges, both in terms of stopping climate change, but also reducing the harms it will cause even if we are successful in cutting our greenhouse gas emissions to zero tomorrow. In 1954, Charles David Keeling, a newly minted chemistry PhD, headed west from Illinois. Not long after arriving in California, he developed the first instrument capable of measuring the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. An avid outdoorsman, he soon started making trips to Big Sur State Park on the California coast, where he spent days camping using his new device to measure the level of carbon dioxide. Those measurements show that the levels had risen since the 19th century. The next year found him setting up instruments in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, which at over 11,000 feet is two miles above sea level. 
By 1958, he had begun collecting carbon dioxide samples at Mauna Loa. The data collection started by Keeling has continued at Mauna Loa, becoming the longest continuous trace of atmospheric carbon dioxide in the world. Keeling's data show that carbon dioxide levels were rising steadily in what has later become known as the Keeling curve. When Keeling started measuring, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere had reached 315 parts per million, up from an estimated concentration of 280 parts per million during the pre-industrial era. Of course, as carbon emissions accumulate, they form a kind of blanket around the globe that retains heat, somewhat like when you snuggle under a blanket on a cold winter's night. Over time, the, your body heat under the blanket begins to increase, uh, uh, excuse me, begins to increase the heat under the blanket. And that heat in the globe carries real consequences. Sea level rise, greater heat extremes, more severe drought, bigger storms, and greater precipitation events. It took three decades for Keeling's groundbreaking work to enter into national policy discussions in a significant way. But on a sweltering day in June 1988 in Washington, D.C., NASA scientist Jim Hansen told Congress he was 99% sure that record temperature increases resulted from growing concentration of greenhouse gases rather than natural variation. By then, atmospheric levels of carbon at Mauna Loa had climbed to 353 parts per million. Two decades after Jim Hansen's testimony, my phone rang. In 2008, I was a judge on the Los Angeles Superior Court and a former White House white collar crime prosecutor. Barack Obama had just been elected as US president. On the call was Janet Napolitano, a friend from law school, asking, how would you like to come to Washington? That moment yielded one of the most important pieces of career advice I can share. Be nice to those you sit next to in school. President Obama had recruited Napolitano to become Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, which is the third largest agency in the federal government after the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs. DHS, of course, had been born out of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, in the largest reorganization of government since the creation of the Department of Defense after World War II. In addition to its anti-terrorism focus, DHS shoulders broad security responsibilities across its close to two dozen agencies, including emergency management through FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, border security through CBP, Customs Border Protection, immigration enforcement, and protection of American waterways through the U.S. Coast Guard. Not long after I arrived at DHS, President Obama issued one of his first executive orders on climate change in October 2009. It required all federal agencies to find ways to cut their carbon emissions, but also for the first time to plan for the impacts of climate change. By the time I received that climate assignment, Mauna Loa scientists had detected carbon concentrations of 384 parts per million. But like so many Americans today, despite uh, Keeling's invaluable contribution to global understanding of the threat posed by the accumulation of fossil fuel emissions in the atmosphere, I did not yet appreciate in 2009 the dangers of climate change. I had had no formal education about climate change. Whatever I knew came from media accounts. In fact, I thought it was something for the distant future and had something to do with saving polar bears. But to respond to Obama's order, I assembled a task force. We members asked ourselves a basic question, one that in retrospect seemed somewhat insubordinate to the president's direction. But until that question had a solid answer, I knew it would be difficult to garner enthusiasm for the task ahead. In the face of widespread skepticism about the reality of climate change, our task force asked ourselves, 
should the Department of Homeland Security in 2009, with all of its other responsibilities, care about the impacts of climate change? We heard from dozens of scientists, planners, and security experts, including the US Navy Task Force Climate Change, NASA, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Based on the evidence, the task force had its answer. DHS should care deeply about climate change. It would affect virtually all of the department's missions. Indeed, it affects all systems, both human-made and natural. In addition to working on climate change, Secretary Napolitano also asked me to head the DHS Leadership Group on Biological Threats. DHS had responsibility for coordinating federal efforts with those of state, local, and tribal governments in preparing for and responding to biological threats, ranging from an influenza pandemic to an aerosolized anthrax attack. It's because of this work and my time on the National Security Council staff, especially special assistant to the president and senior director for resilience policy, that I realized that climate change and pandemics bore deep similarities. 2020 gave everyone a chance to compare and contrast these catastrophic risks. 2020 has certainly shown us why managing catastrophic risk matters. In March 2020, the coronavirus began its deathly gallop from Wuhan, China, across the globe, bringing the world the worst disaster in living memory, a pandemic that invaded virtually every corner of the earth. Hotels went begging for guests, whole industries went into a tailspin, companies reversed course, telling employees not to come to the office, but to work from their kitchen tables instead. With jobs being lost in droves, worldwide hunger spiked, as did domestic violence and child marriage. Meanwhile, governments pumped out trillions of dollars in stimulus packages to support their struggling econ economies and populations. A new vocabulary relating to the disease erupted. Words like lockdown, social distancing, reopening, super spreader, and COVID-19 shot into the English-speaking world at hyper speed. But it wasn't just the worldwide pandemic that caused 2020 to be like no other year. In 2020, climate change, once considered a threat for the distant future, arrived with a vengeance. The effect of the accumulated mission, emissions that Keeling found the way to measure cut their own swath of destruction across the planet. The strongest cyclone ever to make landfall hit the Philippines carrying record-breaking sustained wind speeds of 195 miles per hour. The Atlantic hurricane season carried so many named storms that meteorologists turned to the Greek alphabet to come up with new names. In the Horn of Africa, 200 billion locusts flew in voracious swarms 20 times the size of Paris, devouring 50 to 80% of crops in the field. That's an estimated 8,000 more locusts than would appear in the absence of climate change and the equivalent of 25 for every person on the planet. Temperature soared to likely the highest ever recorded in the Arctic Circle, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, as well as the highest ever likely recorded on Earth, 129 degrees Fahrenheit in the very aptly named Death Valley in California. Historic wildfires consumed so much land in the Western United States, over 10 million acres that a meteorologist with the US government labeled the damage surreal. Explo explosive bushfires in Australia killed 3 billion animals. Zombie fires smoldered through the long Arctic winter in Siberia. 2020's string of record-breaking events also carried a record-breaking invoice for damages. According to the global reinsurance company Munich Re, the economic losses from natural disasters jumped from 166 billion in 2019 to 210 billion in 2020, and the largest share occurred in the United States. 
Both climate change and the pandemic are when, not if problems. Both carry deep uncertainty as to their precise timing and scope, but not as to whether they will happen. Success in combating these two risks requires public support and political leadership. Fighting pandemics and climate change requires use of science to inform decision-making. Both of these risks are borderless disasters. By that, I mean that they will not honor the jurisdictional boundaries humans have crafted over the centuries. And because they cross borders freely, efforts to address the threats must cross borders as well. Communities and nations must work together to reduce risk. And as Sunshine has mentioned, with both pandemics and climate change, it is the most vulnerable among us, people with disabilities, women and girls, older people, and the marginalized that pay the highest price. Any programs to counter these threats must account for the disproportionate impacts. Once either of these threats materialize, they undermine critical systems, including finance, public health, transportation, and national and human security. They act as threat multipliers, increasing vulnerability to horrors like economic impoverishment and criminal mayhem. As the pandemic revealed, failed, weak, or sluggish responses in the immediate aftermath of disasters provide inroads for bad actors to use humanitarian aid to recruit members and expand territory. Rebels in Yemen told young prospects that it is better to die a martyr in heroic battles than dying at home from the coronavirus. The daughters of drug lord and cartel leader El Chapo delivered hand sanitizers and other pandemic supplies in boxes stamped with the picture of their father. And perhaps most important of all, greater preparation and early action for each of these risks can buffer the damage. For both climate change and pandemics, Ben Franklin is right. An ounce of prevention will yield at least a pound of cure. 2020 carried a warning. We need to prepare for growing catastrophic risks. As we are seeing increasingly across the globe in an interconnected world, catastrophic risks bring dire consequences. They certainly have the capacity to cause widespread damages. As an earthquake in China in 1556 showed us, it can be deadly. In that earthquake, an estimated 830,000 people died. In the past, communities have also experienced catastrophic events of the type that we expect climate change will worsen. For example, when the Yangtze River in China flooded in 1931, 2 million people died from drowning and lack of food. Similarly, big storms in the past have caused catastrophic losses. In 1971, Hurricane Bola, Cyclone Bola, struck what is now Bangladesh. The storm cost 500,000 people their lives. As a result of hundreds of years of experience with catastrophic risks, we knew, do know, humans know a lot about what needs to get done to prepare. But we need to prepare for even bigger events in the future. Climate change diverges from what we have experienced in the past in one significant aspect. It brings ever worsening extremes for the foreseeable future. Global lockdowns to contain the spread of COVID-19 put the brakes on economic activity worldwide. The economic slowdown in turn led to a precipitous 8.8% decline in worldwide emissions in the first six months of 2020. That downturn in emissions exceeded any decreases experienced since the Second World War. But the accumulation of greenhouse gas emissions was simply temporarily slowed. The accumulation was not stopped. Even with many of us staying home around the world, emissions eventually began again their upward climb. By December 2020, emissions were up 2% over 2019. 
In 2020, Mauna Loa detected 418 parts per million, the highest level of carbon dioxide in human history up to that time, and likely the highest since at least 3 million years ago, when sea levels were 60 feet above those today. Last week, 419 parts per million were detected at Mauna Loa. And there is no vaccine for climate change. So how can we have a better future? Humans don't have the necessary experience with the ferocity or frequency of events that climate change has already spawned and will continue to spawn. We've enjoyed this steady climate and under the conditions of the past 6,000 years, human civilization has flourished. We have built everything around us and we have grown accustomed to the systems that nature has created based on a stable climate. But the assumption that the Earth's climate will continue to remain steady is no longer a valid one. Because all of our systems were built to withstand the extremes of the past, our infrastructure is at ever growing risk. We have decided, for example, how close we can build to the river and the coast based on past levels of flooding. We have determined how much power our electric grids must be able to generate based on, based on past historical heat or cold events. What happened in Texas with cold weather shows us that if our electric grid collapses under extremes, it brings other systems right down, right along with it. This means that going forward, decisions about where and how we build must account for the future risk of climate change. With climate change, it's what lies ahead that counts. So what can communities and policymakers do? One of the most basic steps is to prompt earlier action by planning. Planning is universally recognized as a way to improve disaster response. Planning can drive creation of stockpiles of necessary supplies, investment in innovation and scientific research. President Dwight Eisenhower, who led the Allied invasion in Europe during World War II, once observed that planning, in his words, steeps decision makers in a problem. As he said, plans themselves might prove useless since in war, nothing typically goes to plan but planning is essential. The United States, however, lacks a plan when it comes to climate adaptation. Instead, the United States government tends to wait for disaster to happen and then our government pours money into disaster recovery, spending most of its funds after calamity strikes. Earlier this year, the government watchdog, the Government Accountability Office, noted that the failure to have a national plan increased the vulnerability of the nation. Other nations across the globe have heeded the call to create robust national adaptation strategies or resilience plans. China unveiled its in 2013, Japan in 2015, Russia in 2019, and Canada is in the process of creating one. The Netherlands, a country that now plans for the one in 10,000 year flood, created its plan in 2017. A national plan can help communities make better choices about where and how people live. For example, in the United States, more than a third of the country's coastal states have added homes in areas prone to flooding since 2009. A similar phenomenon has occurred in the American West with an explosion of homes built in areas vulnerable to wildfire. None of these homes are built to engineering standards that will guarantee that they are livable after the fire or flood sweeps through. This means that Americans are buying and living in homes destined to burn or succumb to flooding. Once the nation creates a national adaptation plan, implementing it may not prove very easy. One of the important concepts with regard to adaptation is managed retreat, at least when it comes to sea level rise. This concept recognizes that as conditions worsen, for example, sea level rise or riverine, riverine flooding grows, people may need to move away from areas as the risk increases. 
A strategy for managed retreat could include warning property owners and prospective buyers of possible future flooding, prohibiting new or additional development in at-risk areas. And where needed, providing financial assistance to assist people to relocate. It could also require that structures be abandoned as conditions have worsened. In short, managed retreat is one of the surest ways to protect people and property from threats like sea level rise. And over the long term, it's likely to be less expensive than building structures like sea walls. How this plays out in the real world may prove challenging. We are seeing a number of examples. Take the city of Del Mar, California. Del Mar is San Diego's county's smallest city. It's a coastal town of about 4,400 residents. It's also a very expensive city. The average value of a home in 2020 in Del Mar was 2.6 million, according to Zillow. The California Coastal Commission has asked the town to develop a plan that would look at how it will deal with flooding risks in low-lying property near the beach. The town faces an imminent threat from sea level rise with its current seawalls expected to provide inadequate protection. But the town has declined to address this issue. It Although the California Commission views long-term planning as essential to preparing for unstoppable sea level rise, residents see the request for more detailed planning as a red flag. Many view the commissioner's requests as seeking a plan for managed retreat. But the people of Del Mar don't want uh, to make a plan for managed retreat. They have repeatedly reject the rejected the commissioner's, commission's requests claiming uh, that it's too small and the property value is too high for it to conduct uh, such an effort. In the words of its mayor, the town wants to defend homes as long as it's possible to do so. The standoff brings me to my last point, the factors that hinder action to prepare for and respond to catastrophic risks and especially climate risks. Until these barriers to, to proper risk assessment are overcome, it may be difficult to make headway on the larger issues. There are many such factors, but three come to the fore. First, lack of education about climate change. Second, a tendency to focus on mitigation of emissions to the exclusion of adaptation issues. And third, an abiding belief that the past will resemble the future. Unfortunately, all too many decision makers, be they senior government officials, politicians, or business leaders, lack any formal education about climate change from either their time in school or as part of a continued education program. This problem is particularly acute in the United States. A survey of the core curriculum of the top 90 universities and colleges in the United States found that the average American college student had just a 17% chance of taking a single class in climate change before graduation through required courses. This lack of knowledge about climate change is also reflected in the resumes of the board members of our top Fortune 100 companies. A 2019 survey of those revealed, and that was a survey of 1188 directors that survey showed when it came to two areas of material importance to most companies and investors, climate and water, and of course climate change is largely a story of water, too much or too little, or water in the wrong places, just five board members had relevant experience with regard to climate. Five, not 5%, 5 and two with regard to water. So we see that very few sectors and very few companies are yet taking seriously the need to prepare for and address climate change. Happily, that's beginning to change, but we need to make sure that there's climate literacy across the board. The second challenge is that ever since the findings of climate scientists broke through the policymaking world in the 1980s and 90s, policymakers have focused almost exclusively on issues of mitigation, at least at the national level. 
And even if we cut emissions to zero today, the Earth will continue to warm for at least the next several decades, bringing ever worsening extremes. We know that preparing can save billions in damages. Enforcement of strong building codes saves $11 for every $1 spent. And doing so seems like a no brainer. Yet an estimated 65% of communities in the United States still lack a disaster resilient building code. So we need to make sure that we also address simultaneously the importance of cutting emissions, as well as the need to prepare for the impacts that we can not avoid. And that brings me to my last point, the cognitive biases that impede decision making. After terrorists flew two planes into the World Trade Center in New York City on September 11, 2011, uh, 2001, the United States immediately embarked on an investigation to determine how such a thing could have happened. One of their major conclusions is that intelligent officers, intelligence officers and other leaders suffered a failure of imagination. They simply could not imagine a terrorist act of that magnitude in the United States. Climate change also suffers for a lack of imagination. We tend to believe it won't happen to us. Our polling shows that even though many Americans think that climate change is occurring, 73% of Americans think global warming will harm future generations. When we get down to the question of whether it will harm ourselves, that number drops to 43%, showing that we tend to underestimate what can come in the future. And another uh, deeply troubling trend is that we need to have experienced the event in order to take it seriously. In other words, we assume that the past will resemble the future when we decide on how to deal with risks but that is just no longer a sound guide. It's been a long time since I studied math, but there's one problem set I have never forgotten, the lily pads on the pond. Suppose you take a walk by a pond with a single lily pad at its edge, and suppose that every day you go by, the number of lily pads has doubled. On the first day, there is one. On the second day, there are two lily pads. And on the third day, there are four. And on the fourth day, there are eight, and so on. So here's the math part. If the pond is covered completely by the 48th day, when was it covered halfway? The correct answer is on the 47th day. If you didn't get that right, you're not alone. In fact, many are surprised to learn that after 40 days of exponential growth, you would barely notice the lily pads as they would cover only one 256th of the pond. Because exponential growth is almost imperceptible at first, it's easy to ignore the steady exponential growth of the lily pads for a long time. That is until they smother the pond. Our failure to appreciate the exponential growth of climate change and its impacts has left us in an increasingly vulnerable state. With climate change, it's what lies ahead that counts. And that is the most important thing I can leave you with. If all of us could internalize the fact that today's one in 100 year record breaking flood will be a one in 25 year event or a one in 10 year in the not too distant future and that what used to be the wildfire season has now expanded to stretch across many months bringing ever bigger hotter fires, we could make and would make different choices. The news about climate change today is not that it's happening, but that it's accelerating. This is an all hands on deck problem. We need everyone finding ways to cut harmful greenhouse gas emissions, but also prepare for the further impacts we will see for the foreseeable future. The past is simply no longer a safe guide for the future when it comes to catastrophic risk. Keeling's work has identified the problem. The question for each of us is what we will do about it. So thanks so, so much. I look forward to your questions really an honor to have a chance to join you today. Thank you so much, Alice. We really appreciate your, your insights on this. Um, so the questions are starting to come in and um, I, I have one to start us off. And that is, um, you talked a lot about the importance of planning processes um, 
And I wonder, but of course the devil is in the details in planning as you know very, very well. So I wonder if there are any examples that you can point to that you think were especially um, effective planning processes um, that, that you have been involved with or that you have seen in other places, kind of larger scale planning processes that really um, brought equity to the table and brought all of these, these different voices to the table. Do you have any examples? Sure, uh, there are two um, very uh, important examples. Uh, one is in Louisiana, uh, a red state, uh, a state that has um, taken some money that they received as a result of the BP oil spill and dedicated it to planning uh, for climate change and uh, for sea level rise and other threats. And they followed a very inclusive process, uh, a process that allowed them to actually identify areas which would be um, essentially abandoned over time. Uh, they drew lines on the map uh, and were able to, through hundreds of conversations with uh, across the board with stakeholders, develop a plan that speaks frankly about the risks it faces. I think that the state loses about a football field of land a day, uh, maybe more, and um, there are some places that will not survive. Uh, so uh, they, Louisiana still uh, needs money to implement this plan, but it's been a, um, I think, a game changer for other communities to realize that the inclusivity can then help you prioritize choices going forward. Uh, and that would certainly be two primary com components for an, any adaptation plan that is developed. It also needs to be an iterative process, uh, one that can be, uh, you can go back to repeatedly to address as you learn more and adjust as time goes on and there's um, greater experience. And the Netherlands, uh, which is frequently cited as one of the countries that has done the most uh, to deal with its climate impacts. Of course, it's an existential threat as it is for Louisiana uh, with the sea level rise at, um, sea level rise threatens uh, a large portion of the nation. But since 2007, they have been engaged in deep adaptation planning. They did, ran a 10-year project called Room for the River, which required uh, some people to move out of certain areas so that uh, the area could be flooded to present to prevent greater harm to larger populations downstream. Uh, and uh, they have then gone on to create additional plans, all with multiple stakeholders at all levels of government. So it can't just be federal top down. It's got to be the state, local, tribal, municipal uh, level leaders, each creating their own plans, nesting within the national strategy. But as the Government Accountability Office, the GAO pointed out, without a strategy, you um, risk, for example, with the Army Corps of Engineers, just sort of dribbling money across the nation or along our, our river and waterways to fix little projects without stepping back. What will really keep the United States better protected? You also have in tremendous equity issues with that because if your cost benefit analysis is based on the value of the property, that's gonna leave uh, some disadvantaged communities out of the picture when it comes to big investments. Uh, and then you, if with a, without a national adaptation plan, um, you just risk that you have all these federal agencies that are going to go out and do wonderful things, but at the end of the day, it will not add up. And they may even be at cross purposes. We see that already because we don't, as a federal government, we don't approach the problem as what can we do to help you communities? Instead, we ask the communities to figure out how the federal government runs. So I'll never forget hearing a mayor of a small town in Alabama, the town's named Perdido Beach, aptly named on the Gulf Coast, facing sea level rise. And she says, I get it. I get my risks. I get that I have a problem. But I'm a small time mayor. I'm part time mayor. I have no planning staff. I have no grant writers. What am I supposed to do? And 
we do not have an answer to that question. And that means that all these small communities are making choices that could leave them actually at greater risk and have already expended a lot of money before they get to the true question of how am I gonna be uh, more resilient going forward? Yeah, thank you. Those are all really important examples. Um, so not surprisingly, a number of questions are coming in that are, are very action oriented, you know? So people want, and there are several questions that I'm kind of mush up together here a little bit. Um, so people want to know, how do we put pressure on policymakers to, to make sure that they are actually moving forward, considering all of these, these considerations as they're moving forward on, on planning and, and making legislation? Do you have suggestions about this from having worked on, on the inside and the outside of these issues? Yes, I think that climate has to be a um, uh, a choice when you're um, voting. Um, and what we see is that we have in a, right now we do have one party that is working on climate and another party that is pretty silent. It wasn't part of the presidential camp, uh, platform for that party. Uh, and uh, we need to vote people in a democracy. We need to vote people into office. And what is the climate plan? We need to elevate this discussion. If you'll recall during the, um, uh, when Hillary uh, Clinton uh, was running uh, against Trump, there was only, I, as I recall, a single question from the audience about climate change. Uh, we certainly saw in the latest debates far more discussion, but it has to be central to any uh, political discussion going forward. Uh, and one of the great challenges for democracy is how we will deal with climate change because it requires um, concerted action, it requires collective action, and uh, that can be easier uh, in um, or it can be easier to take action uh, under different forms of government. So this is a test. And that means that we have to demand of those who are seeking political office that we find out from them how they intend to address climate change. And if that's not on their agenda, for me, that's, you know, that's just the voting issue um, because Climate undermines everything else. It exacerbates inequality. It, um, it destroys wealth. It um, hurts public health. It hurt, hurts everything as it, these impacts unfold. So we need action now and uh, we need to insist that our political leaders are engaged. Do you think, so there's another question that came in from um, an anonymous attendee who points out that there are a lot of conflicts of interest between many politicians and their, their funding, their campaign funding, for example, from um, big oil and, and other fossil fuel companies. So the question is, do you think there's a realistic chance of the U.S. doing more than performative politics or policies to address climate change within that context? And maybe thinking about the, the recent kind of big news regarding board positions with with Exxon and and the decision about Shell. I wonder how you would respond to that question. Absolutely. We're seeing uh, explosion in interest of ESG. I described the problem that many of our board the board uh, members do not have training in this. And we saw that up front that was training on energy uh, or involvement experience with the energy industry with Exxon. But uh, we saw that a minor um, investor overall um, could have a big influence when they recruited some other investors uh, in changing the board makeup. I don't know if having three, three new directors on Exxon will change their direction, uh, but certainly uh, we are seeing that, that corporate boards feel a lot of pressure. Um, so I, I think that's a very hopeful development. Uh, there's an arms race right now occurring for data, for information about how companies can be better prepared for cutting their emissions as well as preparing for the impacts. That's just occurred in the last two or three years. You have numerous startups trying to get into this space and consultancies, which is a welcome development. And you have the legal developments. Um, the litigation has exploded 
in just the last several years. Much of that is occurring in the United States. We still don't know how US courts will come to grips with climate change. I'm a former judge. And uh, one of the things you see is judges saying, wow, this is too big for us. This is really something that needs to be handled in the political sphere, but the political sphere right now isn't handling it um, as well as we would hope. We just haven't had major climate legislation. Uh, so that's a tension, but you've seen internationally, as you've mentioned, uh, particularly again in the Netherlands, um, you've seen cases where Netherlands has told um, uh, the government that it needs to do a better job in cutting emissions. And then we also had this recent decision about a private company saying they needed to do a better job about cutting emissions. Uh, so levers are being pulled at many levels. Uh, the takeaway for me is that, um, as I think Robert Leeson Jr. spotted, it matters. Uh, that you get involved and try to change things and support things and try to in, um, increase the dialogue on these issues. It used to be that no one talked about climate change and when I started on climate change. I was advised not to continue to pursue climate change because it would be bad for my career uh, by very senior people. Uh, unfortunately, that's changed and we so we can move this dialogue into new areas and it just requires all of us to take on the responsibility of each of us of talking about climate change to our friends, investigating what climate positions there are, finding ways to support those leaders who are willing to stick their necks out. Um, and it's very hard at the local level to do that. There's this expression, not in my, uh, N-I-M-T, not in my term. And for a local leader, you've got crime, you've got education, you've got all these other concerns, COVID, and then how can we support a local leader to also say yes, and I want to do better about preparing for climate change and cutting our emissions here. We need to find ways to support those people willing to step up and have a better future. Well, I think that's a, a great spot for us to conclude this, this conversation today. So I, I am very thankful, Alice Hill, that you joined us today. Um, and, and shared some of your experience and insights with us. Thanks to all of you who tuned in today. Uh, we hope that you will join us again tomorrow for the next lecture, um, which is gonna take a closer look, by the way, at how some communities have kind of taken climate adaptation into their own hands. Um, so very much along the lines of some of the, the things we were talking about today. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and, um, and hopefully another time after that. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.